Every year, millions of people come to visit the national parks and view the wildlife in the United States. Now, let's see how many of you can guess the correct number of these folks. Between 2008 and 2012, a study conducted by the National Visitor Use Monitoring Group recorded a number of blank people visiting their national forests. Is it A, 30 million, B, 125 million, C, 460 million, or D, 970 million. If you guessed C, 460 million, then you're correct. 160 million of these people traveled into the forests to view them personally, while around 300 million visitors viewed it from their cars. So you see, an astonishing amount of people are visiting our forests and wilderness every year. And that number is only going to increase as time goes on. So what can we do to minimize the impact that we have on the wilderness and wildlife that lives there when we visit? Good afternoon, everyone. And my name is Alex Wilson. And I'm here today to tell you all about some species native to the Adirondacks show you all how best to avoid these wild animals, and then to explain how to minimize your impact on their natural habitats. There's a huge variety of wildlife that lives in the Adirondack Park, and we see most of it when we venture into the wilderness itself. I'm gonna ask that you pause the video here and return to me once you've found five pictures of common animal species found in the Adirondacks. This should take you about five minutes to complete. Welcome back. Now that you've found some critters native to the Adirondacks, here are nine of the most common species found in the Adirondack Park. Starting off real strong in the number one spot, we have the white-tailed deer. This is one of the most common animals found in the Adirondack Park, ranging anywhere from the pristine wilderness all the way to your very own backyard, sometimes in the middle of a city. Up next, we have three contenders for this nutty spot. The red squirrel, the gray squirrel, and the eastern chipmunk. Now, these pesky little critters can be found pretty much anywhere if you look hard enough, but they can generally be found anywhere where there are deciduous trees that drop seeds with hard shells. Up next, on the number five spot, we have the black bear. Generally, they're found anywhere throughout the state, from forested regions and agricultural areas to semi-rural environments. However, the chances that you'll actually encounter a black bear are slim to none, given that these creatures are very shy. Up next on the list, at number six, is the cute the cuddly, the red fox. Now, these creatures can generally be found in woodland edges and open fields, and indeed, most of them are red, usually more orange than red. They do actually come in a variety of different colors, ranging anywhere from yellow blonde all the way to black. But there is a way that you can tell if you're looking at a red fox or another type of fox. And regardless of what color it is, if you see a white tip at the end of their tail, that's a red fox. Taking the number seven spot, we have the less cuddly and less cute raccoon. Raccoons live pretty much everywhere. There are about 20 to 40 raccoons per square mile in rural areas, and as high as 100 plus raccoons anywhere in a square mile in more developed regions. Now you should be more careful when encountering raccoons in the wild, because they're more likely to actually have contracted rabies due to their scavenging habits. Up next in the number 8 spot, we're actually moving towards the waters with the beaver. These creatures are generally found anywhere ranging from ponds to lakes to rivers. Anywhere where there are sticks and water, you can find beavers. Now, a beaver's front teeth are constantly growing, and so what do they do with that? They use it to make their homes. Beavers use their sawing technique to create their homes out of sticks, trees, and patting down mud into the cracks and crevices to make it watertight. 
And finally, in the number 9 spot, we have the mallard duck. This is one of the most familiar species in New York State, and specifically in the Adirondacks. It's usually well known for its green head and orange feet, and usually takes up residence in boat launches, popular beaches, and regularly used campsites in towns and villages. Now that we've had some screen time, we're going to go over and perform some evasive maneuvers to use if you encounter one of these natural critters, and why these are important to do. We live in a world where animals coexist with us, but we have designated some areas to be specifically designed for them. This is what we call wilderness. When you are in the wilderness and you see an animal, it may be your first instinct to pull out your camera, get closer, and take a quick snap of a rare albino moose so you can send out your daily streaks. This is exactly what we don't want to do for many reasons. Number one, animals are easily startled and might leave an area that is sustainable for them to live. Scaring them from an area like this could endanger their lives and make it harder for them to find food, shelter, and mates. Number two, animals are unpredictable and, if provoked, could attack you if they feel threatened. Some reasons wildlife might do this is because you approached a breeding area, you spooked a mother and her child, or you entered an animal's territory, and it's trying to protect it. And number three, you could accustom the wildlife to humans. Soon they may no longer see humans as a threat, which could lead to dangerous encounters with wildlife. The animal would then have to be hunted and put down for the safety of other humans. Let's use an example. You and your buddies are taking a short hike from your campsite along a well-used trail, and about halfway down, you encounter a male white-tailed deer, and it is about 50 feet ahead on the trail. In order to avoid contact with the deer, this is what you should do. First, lower your voices and do not make eye contact. Wildlife sometimes take eye contact as a sign of aggression and could be provoked to attack. Second, back away slowly from the area until you are out of sight of the animal, or until you are reasonably far enough away from it. And finally, move around the animal, specifically in the opposite direction it was originally heading. For example, if it was heading to your left, then you should move around to your right. The reason you do this is so that you don't block off its original route, and therefore is not impacted by you and your group. Now that you've sat and watched me do these funky moves, it's your turn to practice. Pause the video here to practice, and if you need to rewind and watch me again, make sure to come back to this point when you're done. This should take you about five minutes. Now that we've gone over what animals live in the area, and how not to disrupt their daily lives. We're going to do an activity about how to keep your campsite spick and span, or for lack of a better term, clean, and why this is important. During this portion of the video, I'd like you to pause here and find a piece of paper and a pen. If you're unable to, then use your imagination and paint a pretty picture like Bob Ross. First, write down your favorite food on that piece of paper. I'll give you a few seconds to think of one. Next, take your paper and rip it up into about 20 pieces and throw them on the ground. Make sure they're really spread out. I'll give you a few seconds to do this as well. Finally, close your eyes, spin in a circle 10 times, and then I will give you 10 seconds to pick up as many pieces as you can. Ready? We're gonna start spinning. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now pick up as many pieces as you can. Ten, nine, eight, 
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Time's up. Good job, everyone. I'm pretty sure you picked up quite a few pieces. Now, I'm gonna give you some questions to reflect on. So pause the video here and come back once you have an answer for each of these. Take about 10 minutes to really think these questions over and then I'll go over why keeping a campsite clean is important. Now that we've taken some time to think about ways to dispose of waste and reasons it is important, I'm going to provide you with some information about why it is important to keep the wilderness clean and a few techniques to do so. Animals have a natural diet that keeps them healthy, and by introducing human food to it, it can disrupt their diet and either poison them or make them seek out humans to get more of the food that they're craving. This can lead to dangerous interactions between humans and wildlife and could result in the animal having to be put down for the safety of other humans. It is in everyone's best interest to pack out as much waste as you can within reason so that other people's wilderness experience is not impacted by your previous visit. You obviously can't spend your entire time picking up every piece of granola you dropped. Instead, you can minimize how many you drop by grabbing only a small handful that you can easily fit into your mouth. This will decrease the impact on the wilderness around you. And finally, some ways you can decrease your impact is by preparing food before you travel into the wilderness. Make simple but nutritious meals, or by using a bear line to keep your food and waste out of the reach of wildlife. We've covered quite a bit of material in the last half hour, and I think it's time to reflect on it all. In order for us to respect wildlife, we should first know what kinds of animals are most common around us, as this will help us to know what to do when we encounter these different animals. In order to disturb wildlife as little as possible, we want to lower our voices, back away slowly, and avoid eye contact. Then, we want to move around the backside of the animal so as not to interrupt its original path. And finally, we want to make sure we clean up after ourselves, within a reasonable amount of effort, so that way we do not disrupt the wildlife's natural diet, to make sure that we don't naturalize wildlife to humans, and so that way we prevent wildlife being put in danger if they were to approach us. Each year, millions of people go into the wilderness to take in the fresh air, and to see all that it has to offer. But if we can't respect the wildlife and keep the areas we visit clean, then we're ruining the very thing that we want to see. So be smart, be safe, but most importantly, stay wild, my friends. Now that our lesson is over, I'd like you all to take about five minutes to write down two animals you learned live in the Adirondack Park. One reason to avoid wildlife while in the wilderness and one way to help minimize your impact on the wilderness. Your instructor will be collecting this information and using this to help evaluate your performance during this lesson. Thank you.